I was asked to come here and talk about some of the Chicagoland Grows plants, which um, I'm very happy to do because I've got some experience with quite a few of them. Also to speak about the design aspects of plants and the challenges that we face as well. Marmo maple has been one of my favorite maples for quite a while. I, I know maples are overused, uh, but you can hardly argue with the tree that you can go into the nursery and choose seven of, you know, practically right off the bat that, that match each other, that straight trunks, that got full heads at a, a small size. And then the fall color just can hardly be beat on these things. Um, the marmo is probably my favorite of the Freeman maples, but I have been known to use all of the Freeman maples from time to time. Um, what I uh, wish for out of the marmo is a little more consistent fall color sometimes. I've noticed that uh, they are a little inconsistent. Um, but when I go to design, I think about either contrasting the plant or um, picking up uh, the same color someplace else. So uh, for companions for this, I would choose like uh, Grolo sumac, cranberry bush viburnum, maybe some heucheras and some grasses. So I would get both some of the contrast and also the harmony at the same time. For architectural companions, I like to, to feature these against a white wall or a light roof because it really shows off the, those leaves. State Street Maple, a uh, fantastic tree for streetscapes, parkways, uh, lawns, plant beds. You can use this in lots of different applications. The benefit of this tree, from my point of view, is its scale because it's, um, you know, a little smaller in size. So uh, when you're looking for something that uh, works in a small yard or in a small space, it, it works better than some of the big maples do. Plus, it's widely available. This is a tree that is out there that you can find. Again, you, you come across it in the nursery, and you can choose a bunch of them that match each other very easily, look good at a small size, so your client doesn't have to wait forever for it to turn into a tree. Um, it's not native, but I think we should probably use it more. Uh, companions would be dwarf shrubs and perennials and ground covers. Architectural companions, I think the fall foliage looks great against reddish brown brick or even like blue glass. Um, limestone with rusty yellowy tones, I think, are uh, great. And I think this is just a great tree for small spaces. Crescendo sugar maple, uh, another Chicago land grows tree. I don't have as much experience with this tree, but it is a stately shade tree with a nice head at a small size. Fall color again. Problems? Well, again, overuse of maples. <laughs> and I'm as guilty as anybody of this, but I, I, because I do love them, but uh, that's not the only tree I use. So companions would be like uh, chokeberry or geraniums uh, to pick up on the same colors. The architectural companions might be uh, brick, but I plant it away from the brick, not right up against it or put a brick patio under it. Uh, the foliage displays nicely against light-colored precast as well. White satin birch, which Joe mentioned, uh, like this tree a lot. I chose this in this case for a particular application where we had heavy shade, limited space, and wanted a clustered grove. So um, you'll notice that the bark here is more cinnamony than white. I think that's because it's in so much shade, probably. And young. It'll, it'll and young. So eventually it will get white. Um, I'm, I was hoping that. But I, it's not that the cinnamony, satiny look is bad, though. I mean, take a look at it. It's awfully ornamental just that way. You want some very low-growing plants that will show off the bark with this. Uh, we think the, uh, the bark and the yellow fall color displays well against dark walls. Exclamation plane tree. Uh, great for open lawns, parks, wide par parkways, and plant beds. It has a really nice head at a small size and a strong central leader, just like that exclamation point. Um, the benefits are exfoliating bark. It's very large, so if you want a big tree, here's your tree. 
possible problems. Uh, I don't know how resistant to anthracnose it is. Good resistance. Really good. good resistance. Really good. Okay. Well, I'm hoping that's true. And then hardiness. I know that some growers had some problems with uh, the tree this year. Uh, well, or coming out of the 2013 and 14 uh, winter. So uh, you might be careful about where you put the tree. Architectural companions across from white or beige walls or silhouetted against a dark background. And that could be architecture or it could be some evergreen trees behind it, which would be really nice. And it coordinates really well, the bark does, with limestone walls nearby. Uh, China snow uh, tree lilac plant beds and as a single specimen I think this works really well. It's a very wide spreading tree though so it needs room. Um, the benefits are the satiny bark and it's very urban tolerant as well. But I see one of the problems is, is that it looks a little rangy, a little wild sometimes. So if you have a client that wants something that's very neat and tailored you might rethink this choice. Um, also, a lot of people are allergic to lilacs, and so you have to think about where you're putting it in that respect. Architectural companions, I think it displays really well against cool hues. Um, but then the brick patios or walkways also pick up that bark color, and so that gives you some harmony in your landscape as well. And the bark shows off well against light precast also. So there are lots of choices with ways that you can go with that plant. Accolade elm. Um, again, I haven't used this a lot. My partner Bernie has used it more. We have thought until recently that this is a very adaptable tree that you could use in parking lot islands and parkways, uh, and as well as, of course, uh, plant beds. And it does look beautiful in LA's also. It's a stately tree. It needs room. It has glossy dark green leaves and is urban tolerant. However, um, I think coming out of the 2000 and 2014 winter, it had some problems of hardiness. So that's our experience, and I uh, don't know if everybody has found that to be true. I think they, they did better in the nurseries than out on sites. And so when I said that we thought it was very adaptable to streetscapes and urban uses, maybe it's not quite as adaptable as we thought. That's my thought on that. Um, companion plants, other shrubs that turn yellow in the fall, I think would be great nearby this. Uh, and architectural companions, um, I, I've seen it used uh, by beige precast that looks very nice. Triumph Elm is one that I've used more often than Bernie has. <laughs> and uh, again, uses in parking lots, parkways, plant beds, and as a shade tree. Um, We've had a few problems like the accolade as well. This tree gets, I think, a little bit larger than accolade does, but they, they both are big trees. And it's supposed to develop an arch with age, which um, I think would be fantastic. The ones that I have on sites aren't big enough that they're really displaying that yet. Uh, companions, uh, you, uh, I, I like roses near them. Uh, I'm not sure why, but I, I, I think it must be the glossy foliage and the same shape of foliage. Um, architectural companions, the dark uh, shiny leaves look great against light colored and matte finish uh, facades or backgrounds. So these are some more trees from Chicagoland Grows. I'm not as familiar with them, so I didn't do individual slides on them, but uh, some of them are, are interesting. I almost used Little King twice, but then decided I wanted a larger tree, so I didn't. And uh, I'm very interested in the maize delights, but uh, crab apple, but I wonder how available it is at this point. So that, that's something I'm, I'm, I might like to, to try. Some of, the, some of the trees I'm interested in but are not Chicagoland grows trees, I've pictured here and, and can talk about. Uh, Perfection honey locust, it has fewer spider mites than skyline honey locust does. I just used them at the Chicago River Walk and, and they just look spectacular there. Um, the upright oaks Joe talked about, 
we've used regal prints and, and uh, uh, kindred spirit. We've also used crimson spire, but we've had some problems with crimson spire, so I'm not sure about that one. Espresso coffee tree is an interesting tree. No fruit, that's great. Sometimes, not always. I like the fruit, but sometimes you need a tree without the fruit. Uh, the northern, uh, sorry, getting ahead of myself, Tannenbaum pine had the best hardiness of any evergreen that I saw when I was in the nurseries after the 2013 and 14 winter. It's not widely available at all. I would like to see nurseries growing that tree because it is a beautiful tree. And it's not, it's not a dwarf mugo. I mean, it is a tree form mugo. Um, Merrily crab is, a, is a, an introduction from Schmidt that I would like to see the growers growing because sometimes we need fruitless flowering trees. So it's a very pretty tree, and if you're not familiar with it, it has a rose-like blossom, which is very interesting. Uh, Northern strain sour gum uh, was, was uh, very lucky to be able to uh, find a few of those for a project, and I wish that they were more available, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I think it, it probably wants a more acid environment than we have here, but uh, maybe, maybe we can find places to use it. Yes. Uh, the Fort McNair horse chestnut. I don't know how it does with the scorch. Maybe not so good, but it is such an ornamental tree and such a, a different kind of a, a look. I think it's uh, definitely worth using. So moving on to shrubs. Iroquois Beauty, Joe mentioned, fabulous plant. I'm using it way over probably at this point because it's so ornamental. It has everything. It has flowers, it has fall color, it has berries. I think it's just great. Um, and again, it's, it's one of those companions that turns that red color so that if you're using some fall color elsewhere, it'll pick up that fall color, which is fantastic. I plant uh, uh, heuchera next to it or um, especially maybe a, uh, one with sort of blackish leaves that, that then the, the, even the fruit will, will give you a little harmony there. Veronica Whitewater, maybe I'd put near it, might be pretty. Um, the dark shiny leaves, white flowers and black fruit look great against wood fences, for example. Um, and the, uh, and bluestone picks up the cool tones of the fruit. So I, I think it's just a, it's a really useful plant. Uh, Hedges, screens, mixed borders, foundation plantings, you can use it everywhere. Northern Charm Boxwood. Uh, frankly, I'm tired of boxwood. <laughs> but it does have shiny evergreen foliage and a moundy habit, which is kind of nice. It's uh, supposed to be more cold hardy. Um, problems probably could be salt, I would think. Uh, but companions for that, uh, Gallium motoratum or Pachysandra at the base would be pretty, or an Adirondack crab behind it. I agree, Adirondack crab is a great crab. Um, anyway, architectural companions, pretty much anything. Classically, you know, brick, bluestone, <sighs> limestone. Uh, prairie flame, shining sumac. Uh, Looks great with native plantings, needs room. Uh, its benefits are shiny foliage, red fall color, white, yellow white flowers in midsummer, and great seed heads too. The problems we've seen are rabbits. So uh, if you have a rabbit problem, I don't think I would use this plant. I, I, I don't know, does anybody not have a rabbit problem? <laughs> Um, but companions would be things like bur oaks and gray dogwoods and grolo sumac and prairie grasses. Um, architectural companions, white backgrounds and limestone walls, I think, work really well with it. Autumn jazz arrowwood viburnum is a good background hedge. Um, I'm not a huge fan of this plant. Uh, I think it can look a little leggy from time to time, and I think it needs a foreground planting in front of it. So if you've got some room and you can push it back away, then great. 
but uh, I wouldn't bring it forward in, in a bed. One good thing about it from an architectural point of view is that if you have a really ugly fence or wall, it'll hide it. Red wing viburnum, what is not to love about this plant? This is just a beautiful plant. Um, hedges, plant beds, as a specimen, it's gorgeous. The uh, wine-colored new foliage that you get is like an added plus to the flowers, the fruit, the fall color. I mean, it just is a great plant. Um, it's, it's, it's like it's got the gift that keeps on giving. It needs a little room. I mean, it's not a, a real dwarf shrub. Um, companions would be other trees that turn red, summer blooming dwarf shrubs, perennials, and ground covers, because it's just, it, it, it's, it's a great um, mixed border shrub, I think, too. Um, architectural com companions, the white stems and the bright berries show off really well against dark walls. So these are the other shrubs of the program, I'm, ones I'm not as familiar with. Uh, the Scarlet Beauty Sweet Spire to me is intriguing. We've used Little Henry before. I've never used this particular one. Um, I'm already a fan of Diervola. We've used other Diervolas. This one, I think, is probably very nice too, and I'll find a use for it at some point. Um, the uh, Bayberry, I'm a little more cautious on. Um, I've used bayberry before. It's been sort of marginally hardy, I think. So um, I might try this, but certainly it's very, I mean, the pictures of those bluish white berries are beautiful, so it's worth maybe trying. Uh, moving on to the perennials, Pixie Meadow Bright Coneflower. I'm sure many of you have already used this plant. It's a great plant. I wonder about persistence. Uh, because I think a lot of the coneflowers have had persistence problems. Uh, but I have this in my yard and it's still growing and I'm not like uh, a gardener who fusses over their plants. I let them do their thing pretty much on their own most of the time because I'm too busy to be a full-time gardener. Uh, but it's very showy, uh, you know, with that composite with the orange-brown center and it naturalizes well meaning that you can, you can put it in a meadow planting and it'll look just as home there as it would in a, in a more structured perennial garden. And I think of this as like if you want the Mexican themed garden, go for the bright furniture and, and uh, some orange plants in with it too. Uh, you could do something very festive. Pink cotton candy betony. Uh, like this very much, the pink uh, flower spike displays really nicely above very neat foliage below it. The flower heads tend to flop in summer, like right about now. Um, Humello doesn't do that. So you have to think, the pink is worth something, but are you gonna deadhead the flowers? So, um, in part shade, it looks great with hostas. It can't compete with Allium Summer Beauty, so don't try to combine them. <laughs> uh, architectural companions, I think any sort of pastel environments that would just be beautiful in. Midnight Prairie Blues False Indigo. I have this in my garden too, and, and I love it. Um, it's uh, great in perennial borders, in native plant beds, and in the meadows. The blue spike flower displays really beautifully. It's a big plant though, so it needs to be at the back of the border or it, it, it needs just to, um, sometimes you might even want to stake the plant. Now it doesn't look like it there, but in my garden it would do better if it were staked. Uh, companions, other prairie plants, uh, but it, it, it will work in a perennial garden very well. It looks great against a white fence, something that's at the back of the border. Carousel blue stem, again, native plantings, meadows. The silvery foliage turns red, pink, and tan in the fall. 
benefits. It's a native grass. We like to be using natives. Problems, it flops. And I have a picture there to show you. So um, needs to be used someplace where it gets support from some other plants nearby, maybe. I think it complements many tones because it, it does have this uh, sort of kaleidoscope of color. And these are, are the other perennials of the program. The false indigos I think are amazing. I especially like the blue mound. And I put, so that I put two pictures. The first two on your left there are the false indigo. I like the way the mound looks. So I might try this. And I think I might be happier with it than the midnight prairie blues actually. The, uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, pink cushion flocks, but I think the violet pinwheels may have some merit. So, uh, And the cone flowers that they have are beautiful, but again, I worry about persistence because I haven't had a lot of luck getting them to persist in, in the gardens that I've put them in. Prince Charming Solomon Seal, I think would brighten a woodland planting, and I think I would definitely like to use that plant. And uh, so would the chartreuse butterflies, woodland sunflower. I, I think that probably needs a little more room, though. The whitewater speedwell, I, I will definitely try that. I never have. But I like water peri blue, and so I probably would like this one, too. Uh, Fire marshal bee balm could work really well in a red and white garden, especially one that maybe was next to a rain garden or some some place where you've got some native plantings working in, too. So I'm going to leave you with a designer quote. <laughs> there are a few plants that are ugly. It's how you use them that may not be pretty. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I think I'll turn this over to Roy Didley.